Welcome back, 3D MJers. It's been a while since I've peeled back any layers, and uh, that's what we're going to get to. Um, my apologies for not having been around to, to peel back these layers recently. I'll try to adjust my uh, camera here. Been in the UK, been working with clients, been doing my PhD, all that stuff, and uh, just want to apologize on taking some time out on this series. I wanted this to be semi-regular, so we're going to try to get back to that. So. Today's question is, is time under tension important? Is this a variable that we as bodybuilders, people interested in getting bigger, should be tracking? Why and why not? And I know often people are saying time under tension has got to be important. You know, that's the whole reason why different rep ranges are used to, to modify and augment time under tension. You have to create metabolic fatigue. You've got to worry about total volume, and that's how much time under tension you have. So we've got to pay attention to this on every set. So we need to track our tempos, we need to make sure we use the right rep ranges, etc. Okay? So that is the prevailing thought, and it's very common to see in uh, textbooks and in studies and in just protocols people give of people tracking uh, the tempo of lifting and thus, thus make sure they're using the optimal time under tension uh, for each set. Now, let's, let's go back a few episodes to when I talked about total volume of work, right? And uh, I, I, I expressed that most likely, if you were to take a 5x5 five five times 120 pound protocol compared to a three sets of 10 at 100 pound protocol, that'd be the same amount of total work if you did the math, sets times reps times load, and that growth would actually be very similar despite large differences in uh, obviously different, different number of reps, different load, and different time under tension. So, the first thing. Let's just kind of go through what we're talking about here. So, time under tension. Is it important? The first bullet point here I have is lessons from NASA. NASA. That's the U.S. Space Agency. Why am I talking about NASA and, and bodybuilding? So, there's lessons we can learn from astronauts. Okay? Astronauts, they leave the Earth's gravity, and this is the fastest possible way to lose muscle. You start losing all kinds of lean tissue when, when you leave the confines of gravity. Because where does tension come from but gravity? When we're lifting weights, we're actually lifting gravity, right? Their mass is being pulled by gravity. And in fact, the entire time we're on Earth, we are holding ourselves upright and resisting gravity. So we're always under tension. So in fact, me being 31, I turned 31 in April, I have had 31 years of time under tension. So I should just be massively huge. Obviously, there are people bigger than me, and it's not like the older you get, the bigger you get, unless, of course, you've been progressively weight training the whole time. But the point being is that it's not just about the time under tension, but also the magnitude, right? So it has to be heavy enough to create growth. And obviously, if you lose Earth's gravity completely, you'll get smaller. And if you go back to Earth, you'll get bigger again, but only to a point. So it's not just about time under tension, clearly. If I did curls concentration curls with this marker, I wouldn't grow at all. And that's because no matter how long I make sure that I'm, con I'm contracting, that is not a high enough magnitude of tension. Okay. So, is time under tension the only variable we need, we need to pay attention to? Probably not. We need to make sure that there's also the adequate magnitude of tension. But how much is heavy enough? And are we pretty sure about this whole volume thing being the most important? Well, cool thing happened only a few months after I made that video on uh, matched volume programs 5x5 five five versus 3x10. Uh, now Dr. Schoenfeld came out with a study, which I've got in the comments below, where he took a powerlifting style program and a bodybuilding style program, one doing sets of two and one doing sets of, I believe, ten, equated the volume, is pretty close, and then found that over the course of time, there was an equal amount of muscle growth that occurred. However, the bodybuilding protocol took a much shorter period of time, and the powerlifting program took a lot longer, and that was primarily due to longer rest periods. But a double, even at a heavy load, is probably only going to take five or six seconds to complete, while even at a moderate tempo or even a fast tempo, doing a full ten reps is probably going to take at least three times as long as doing two reps. So here we see vastly different time under tension between these two protocols, vastly different rest periods, yet the same amount of growth. So time under tension must be a secondary concern to both load and total volume. So that's something to keep in mind. 
So that means that if you're going to pay attention to time under tension, pay attention to time under tension, yeah. If you're going to focus on time under tension, you have to make sure that you don't put the cart before the horse and accidentally make yourself lift less weight and thereby do less volume or reduce your total volume of work because you're really worrying about how long your eccentric contraction was, okay? So, do we have any evidence for this or is this just Eric talking? All right, we've got an interesting study by Headley et al. back in 2011, where basically what they did was they figured out people's one rep max if they used a moderate tempo of two-second eccentric, two-second concentric with no pause versus a slow tempo where they had a two-second concentric, four-second eccentric and no pause. Basically just really slowing down that eccentric, and they found that people were, were stronger when they didn't purposely slow down weights. That's not surprising. But then what they found was that when they took a percentage of that 1RM and then had people do multiple sets and eventually a set to fatigue while maintaining that tempo and equated and, and then figured out how much actual work they did, measured the distance of the bar travel and calculated work in joules. This isn't just sets times reps times load. This is a true physics calculation of work. They found the group that did moderate tempo actually did about 11% more total work than the group that slowed it down. So this is an example where if you lose used what I might describe as an artificially slow tempo of lifting, you're actually reducing the total amount of work you do. So you're re because you're trying to increase the time you're spending under tension, you're decreasing the magnitude, and the overall output is a reduction in stimulus for growth. Okay? So what does that mean? Well, it means just don't put your cart before your horse. Now, moving further about the magnitude of tension being important. If you see at the bottom here, we've got Campos, 2002. Campos did a very similar thing to Schoenfeld did recently, except he had three different rep range groups. He had a heavy, heavy group, a moderate group using kind of like what we might describe as hypertrophy rep ranges, and then a group that did like 20 plus reps, very, very high reps, and equated volume in all of them. Now the interesting thing here is that the growth was the same in the, in the low sorry, in the low rep group and the moderate rep group, so moderate load, heavy load, low reps, moderate reps. However, the group with the highest reps, even though they did the same amount of volume, did not gain uh, muscle mass equal to the other two groups. Now the question is why? Well, because, now, now here, just think about it. If you've got a 20 or 30 rep set, that's a very high degree of time under tension from when you start lifting the weight to when you stop. However, how long is it going to take if you're doing a very light load for it to eventually start fatiguing fibers and creating a growth stimulus? Well, probably going to take more than half the set. So how many of those reps were actually effective for muscle growth? Not many. So if, you have to, if you're using your 30 rep max, that means it's only probably the last eight or seven reps that are actually an effective stimulus for growth. When you've built up metabolic fatigue, when you fatigued out some of those uh, easier to fatigue fibers and when you're down to just the high threshold motor units that are still trying to get the, the curls done, right? So, even though you've equated volume, if you're going too light, that means that too many of those reps and too much of the time you spent under tension is not at a high enough magnitude of tension to produce a growth stimulus. So the take home message here is that time under tension is nice, but what we're really trying to get to when we think of time under tension is our total volume. And again, that's what it's going to come down to. So we need to, A, remember that we're always under tension and that the magnitude of tension must matter. That's a lesson from the astronauts. That the total volume of work in the end is what matters. But after volume, we have to think about the magnitude of tension, which is the load. We can't go too light. And then if we go too slow, that will reduce not only the maximal strength that we have, we have to lift lighter if we're going to go slower, and the total amount of work we're doing. So time under tension, is it important? Yes, but only because it contributes to volume. And you've got to lift heavy enough. So not just time under tension, but time and magnitude of tension, which, guess what, is volume. All right, folks, we peel back another layer. Make sure to check out the, uh, the commentary below so you can see these three studies if you want to read up further. And I will see you guys next time.